great pleasure to have a chance to talk to Hans van der Ven, who I've known for many years now at various committees and other such things. Hans, um, when and where were you born? I was born in 1958 mm -hmm. in The Hague, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And um, tell me something about your ancestors. The last person I interviewed who was Chinese um, said, well, I go back 3,800 years. <laughs> that was um, Kent Deng. Uh -huh. So probably you don't go back that far, but grandparents or whatever you'd like to go uh, back we, to. We have family trees that go back to the 15th century. Mm. Uh, but I don't really pay much attention to mm. that. It's sort of in living memory, it is my both my well my grandmother on my father's side is a, is a sort of figure. The most important figure I think is my grandfather on my mother's side, who I never knew for the simple reason that he, during the war, he was taken prisoner by the Germans, ended up a slave labor and died uh, near, not, not that far from Berlin in the last day. It was just after liberation actually, but he was dysentery and so on. Mm. Uh, but as an image, he became a very important figure, mm. uh, as happens in these things in part because mm. uh, his body was never found. Mm. A couple of years ago, we went with cousins and nephews and my family my, and some of my children to retrace his steps. Mm. So it ke just keeps echoing through mm. uh, and sort of war memories around that mm. are very important. Um, and he was a very interesting man, He's, he was a very happy man it seems. Um, he was very proud of the place where he lived, Schiedam, near Rotterdam. Um, he had been uh, trained for uh, as a sailor for the Dutch Merchant Marine, uh, and just about as he was taking over a ship, they discovered he was color blind, <laughs> so, which is a problem at night at sea uh, because you don't mm. you know, can't see green and red. Uh, <laughs> so he was let go, and then after he was let go, he married. He was a Protestant family. Um, he found his wife. I, we don't know how this happened, uh, but she was Catholic. And so I think it's quite remarkable that she, he converted, uh, adopted the Catholic faith mm. in what was a very Protestant community uh, mm. in Rotterdam and became one of the town's notables and enjoyed lots of stuff. Uh, he was a sailor, went around mm. uh, in Holland in little boats. Uh, he came to London and bought lots of antique because it was very cheap in London. Um, and so that, that, that stuff is... Mm. Uh, and we still have a lot of furniture from that time. Was he an antique dealer or what? Did no, he no, no, no. What did he do? They just had money. Um, her family was in the, they were in the, in the wine, beer and gin business. Mm. I think especially the gin that made money. Mm. Uh, and the gin, of course, was cheap alcohol for mm. the poor Rotterdam mm. proletariat. Mm. Uh, whose suffering we relieved or who we poisoned, as you like. But. Mm. Um, that's where the money came from. Yeah. Yeah. So that's mm, the main person in your grandparents' yeah, generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming down to your parents, tell mm. me something about them. My father uh, was born in 1928, 27, something like that. His life was heavily shaped by the war because uh, he was a teenager in Holland. He had to flee. But the Razzias, I don't even know what, if there's an English word for this, the Germans would come around and round up young men for the armed mm. forces and they would hide somewhere in the countryside. Uh, and then in 1945, he was 18, uh, he decided he wanted to be a hero, went to Indonesia and fought there for four years, fighting young men who also thought they needed to be heroes. 1945? Yeah, so he was there from 45 to 49. What, what was happening in Indonesia during that time? This was uh, the Indonesian... Um, oh, the Civil War. Mm. Not yet, no. This was the war against the Dutch, of course. Ah, my uh, history on that is a bit hazy. It's interesting <laughs> that the Dutch Empire gets mm. written out of everything <laughs> and forgotten by the Dutch, mm. shamefully enough. But, yeah, so this is where sort of my grandfather uh, was a resistance worker, helped pilots, stuff like that. Mm. Supposed to have pilots. There's lots of stuff we don't really know. 
Um, but there's a certificate declaring him a war hero. And of course, my father ended up the opposite. Um, so it's very conflicted. And he suffered from that a great deal. Um, not that he ever talked about it, but it was obvious. Um, uh, he worked for the Catholic Church. So the Catholic background is an important part of my own background. Um, yeah. Uh, I th my mother suffered polio as a young child, so she was in bed for a long time. And I think it's that and the death of her father mm. at a very vulnerable age, mm. with families falling apart all over the place. And then, of course, the hunger winter when everybody was mm. had serious famine. Um, that shaped her life. And then I think their marriage was profoundly affected by the death of my younger brother who drowned um, in 61, 62, something so like that. So how old was he? He was, he was, he was one, he was two years old or something mm -hmm. like that. He walked into a ditch and, um, mm -hmm. um, and I think very few couples mm -hmm. survived that kind of... So did they break up? Or? They, yeah, and they broke up, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How did their personalities affect you, do you think? Um, Were they right. academic or...? No. But my father went to university, but because they're Catholic, so there was mm. only one university to go to in Holland. This was still an issue then, although not later. Uh, and then he worked as an economist for the Dutch Catholic mm. Church. Uh, but they didn't go for any higher degrees. Uh, but he loved learning mm. and read widely. He was deeply interested in history. <coughs> and I think that did affect me. And he had a, um, I'm sure that did. And he had a real interest in the world beyond Europe and his mm. Indonesian background mm. must have mattered to that. It was a real curiosity, actually. Mm. Um, so that was, that was very good. Um, for my mother, I think uh, her stubbornness is something I share <laughs> and I'm usually grateful for, but not always. <laughs> um, and the story she told about her own upbringing uh, with her father before the war, uh, which was full of adventure and fun and countryside and walking and uh, building things with your hands and so on, mm. I think that is rubbed off on me in, in mm. many ways. I mean, we own a sailboat and I think that's mm. a big part of my life and that, mm. that echoes through, yeah. Mm. So you just had one brother? Oh no. Um, I had, uh, I have an older brother. He was, uh, uh, he never went to secondary school, let me put mm. it that way. Uh, but he's a great hero of mine. Mm. Um, he is, is a wonderful brother, uh, extremely supportive, and he has achieved things in his life mm. that show great character. Uh, he lives independently. Um, he has a fiancé, which he now has for 35 years. <laughs> um, he's been very good to my children, to my wife, he's, and he's, he is fun-loving. Mm. Uh, he knows his own it's actually really worked out very nicely. He, he knows his own shortcomings. Doesn't, he doesn't ask me for help, but he asks my sister for help. So that works very well. So I'm very proud of him. Mm. And genuinely, you know, yeah, absolutely proud. Mm. Um, and I think he knows it. Um, my, then I had two sisters. One is now in her 50s, just turned 50. She lives in Holland, she's married, two daughters, has mm. gone through very difficult periods, but uh, is now very happy, very settled, and very productive, mm. uh, and is running various, uh, you know, uh, civil societies. Mm. And, she's mm. uh, and then my second sister, unfortunately, died when she was thirty-one mm. uh, from suicide. Um, what is your first memory? Um, yeah. <laughs> and at what age? I forget my age, it was two or three, but it is of my youngest brother dying. Is it? No. Yeah, yeah. The parents coming back and telling you, presumably you didn't no, see it? I didn't see it, but an uncle 
I, mean, I know the place. There's no photograph of it, mm. so this must mm. be a serious memory or a delusion, as you mm. like. Uh, but the complete panic around this. The, mm. uh, the ambulance coming, people trying to console people, being mm. so, yeah. yeah so mm. Not the greatest. Uh, not no. the best memory to start your life with. No. Um, and then you went to a uh, kindergarten and then a primary school. Is that the way it works there? We, I didn't go to kindergarten. Um, we were, well, yeah, kindergarten. Um, yes, and this was, we had moved from this area near, near The Hague to uh, a place near Haarlem, which is itself is close to Amsterdam, uh, above uh, the North Sea Canal, which the cuts mm -hmm. through the province and connects Amsterdam to the sea. Um, and yeah, and so and this was still the time of, of uh, the division in education, at least, between the various religious groupings in mm -hmm. Holland. So, yeah, so I was in did a Catholic you go down the Catholic stream? Uh, yeah, 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 until university, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And um, around sort of eight, nine, mm. you go to school. From that time on, are there any teachers who particularly? Yeah, there are. Um, we had a teacher, like several. Uh, I like most teachers. Mm. Uh, the, the ones that stand out was in my fifth year of primary school. There was a teacher who liked history a lot and was very good at telling stories. And I was thinking about this the other day. The other thing that I remember from my primary school is we, we were reading all these Catholic hagiographies. Mm. I thought they were great. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Mm. You know, all this wonderful stuff happening. And, mm. um, yeah, I just devoured them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lots of martyrdoms. Yeah, lots of martyrdoms, exactly. I mean, <laughs> And that's sort of, you know, you, I'm sort of kind of sorry for all these Protestants who have missed this. <laughs> and, sort of <laughs> and if this is, and, and hagiographies are important, mm. more important in Chinese upbringings, of mm. course, and you get them back in sort of Maoist cartoons, they're mm. often very hagiographical. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I fancy there's a connection there, and I understand mm. where this is coming from. Anyway, so he was one teacher. Then I did Latin in my secondary school, of course. Uh, and it was a wonderful teacher, an older woman. Uh, it was very, extremely encouraging, um, f and I think helped me a lot uh, in sort of growing intellectually. Uh, but she also made it absolutely clear that I should not continue with my letter. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she sent me on, and I, I was much more mathematical than mm -hmm. linguistic at that point. And I think in second teacher, and well, it's a teacher who's very clearly shaped me, um, was a teacher of English. Mm. Uh, in, and I had him for the last three years of my secondary school. Uh, and this, at this time, I was in a boarding school. Mm. Um, this was so how, how, old, how old were you? From 15 to 18. Mm. Uh, and um, that, was, uh, that boarding school was terrific, because mm. we hang out with very similar sorts of people. Um, uh, but he was great because he, he was odd, definitely, super bright, traveled the world, I guess, uh, but he sort of tossed the textbooks away mm. and we learned English by listening to the songs of Bob Dylan, <laughs> <laughs> reading Kurt Vonnegut mm. and all that stuff, mm. and, you know, the kind of stuff you would read in the 70s if you wanted to be cool. Um, <laughs> and he took us to English language theatres in Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, we went hiking together. Um, some other teachers, they were all really dedicated teachers mm. and lived with us as students. And I think mm. that is something, of course, we sort of do in Cambridge. I think mm. it's a great thing. Uh, and some, and, you know, they took us to trips to Paris and mm. uh, they hang out with us. And um, yeah, that was really good. Um, and from was, that, this was a uh, single sex boarding school. It was single sex boarding school, uh, but it had just begun to admit girls mm. who could not board, of mm. course. Mm. Uh, but the, the majority, well, there were only two or three girls when 
mm. when I was there. Mm. It was a very free-spirited school, mm. and not, not under the control of the Dutch state, well, funded by the Dutch state, of course, mm. but run out of um, two bishoprics. Mm. Uh, and they just did what they wanted to do, mm. and that was great, absolutely. Uh, we read all kinds of literature, did all kinds of music, theatre. We had the run of this place in the evenings. And, um, great. So the other things you do at that age are sport. Yeah. Um, were you interested and good at sport? Uh, I was not very good. Mm. Um, I t well, I was not very good. I played hockey in my hometown, so not mm. for the school. It mm. was not school-based. I was good for a bit, and then I sort of gave up, and it was mm. no good. But it was a club of friends, uh, and several of them, I have, well, some of them I've known since I was five, but mm. some of them uh, I still see regularly. We go mm. sailing together. Uh, so mm. bonds were made. Uh, and of course, the other sports uh, mm. I did then, um, yeah, uh, was sailing. And mm. I, I became a sailing instructor. Mm. A little dinghy boat, I mean, nothing, mm. nothing seaworthy at that point. But um, that too was, but that's, you know, that's not athletic. Mm. You, know, mm. you just need sailing is, if you want to call it a sport, go ahead. But, uh, <laughs> what about hobbies and interests outside academic work, apart from sailing? Were there, do you have any others? Not really. You played a bit of chess, but mm. again. Didn't collect like, things or. No. Um, and what about music, apart from Lonely Donegan and, well, Lonely Donegan was earlier, um, Bob Dylan and that era, um, were you getting interested or did you play music? I played the flute for a while, mm. but this is all sort of part of the aspiring bourgeois social stratum we belong to. Mm. Uh, so in order to sh show your status, you're supposed to play hockey and do some music and this mm. and that. And uh, I was never really committed to that. So I thought mm. it was a bit pretentious, really. Um, so I, I wasn't. Uh, in music, I was interested in music, in sort of listening to music, uh, mm. you know, collecting records and um, stuff like that. But nothing, you know, like all teenagers mm. do. Um, but nothing. Do you, do you still listen to music? I do, yeah, yeah, all the time. What? What music do I'm you extremely like? eclectic, mm -hmm. um, ranging with some from classical, which I picked up from my wife, who is very mm -hmm. much classical, uh, to very jazzy. Um, hip hop goes too far from me, but mm -hmm. um, my sons shape my music. I listen to the stuff they listen to. Uh, yeah, they, uh, but from, from yeah, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, just you just don't very work. Bad. You don't work listening no, to music. No, I don't music. work at it. No. Some people do, some don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing is you, you're in a Catholic school. I mean, I don't know how that system works. At my Protestant school, at the age of about 14, 15, you were confirmed into the Anglican faith. And it also seemed to coincide, coincide not only with puberty, but also with yeah. um, the heightened kind of religiosity, which I went through for a few years. Did that happen with you? We, this was a moment of it, yes, yeah, the confirmation of course mm -hmm. is important in the Catholic, and it's last year, of, in our case, last year of uh, primary school, and, and my anxieties were, which Protestants wouldn't have had, about having to go to confession, mm -hmm. uh, which seemed a very odd thing to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the Dutch Catholic Church at that time, uh, and my father's are much part of that movement, was very liberal, and they mm. decided it was absolute nonsense mm. to have 12-year-olds go to uh, confession. Mm. Uh, so I was spared that ordeal. And then quickly after that, um, the, you know, the wave of, of letting go of religion mm. and breaking down all the barriers between the various religious groups in Holland sort mm. of set through and mm. certainly swept me away, and I mm. very quickly stopped going to church. And what age? 14, 15. You stopped going to church? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how about the rest of your life? I mean, are you an atheist, an agnostic, um, a lapsed Catholic? What are you? All of those. <laughs> There's no easy answer, is there? Um, 
uh, I don't go to church. Mm. Uh, I don't read the Bible, which is just Catholics, so you don't mm. have to do in any case. Um, but, but are you interested in spiritual things? No, not, not in my own life, no. 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 I mean, studying China doesn't make you interested in its non-religions. I, it's, I recognize the importance of religion, of course. Mm. I like the way that Chinese go about religion, mm. uh, which is much more livelier and fun, uh, mm. colorful. And, mm. uh, I think that's all that's great. But, uh, you know, so an enthusiastic observer, but mm. not, not a committed participant. participant no. Right, so um, you're not involved in politics at all at school. I mean, you're not politically conscious. Oh, it was actually. I did write stuff for. Um, I'll, I'll tell you something that's actually rather interesting, um, given where we are now. I, I wrote for the school newspaper and mm. did political commentary, mm. and, which must have been completely embarrassing at so mm. many levels. <laughs> um, but I did what I wanted. We had, again, we had a very good history teacher, and our Dutch history textbooks, this was when the EU was, or the European Union, you know, the whole thing began and it was completely um, pro-Europe mm. and um, I, was, I was bullshit and rebellious and sort of raised my finger and said, <laughs> this is just propaganda isn't it sir <laughs> and, and then the whole class was utterly sick of me and oh shut up <laughs> and he turned around and said no and he goes well I said, so, so I said what, if you are going to criticize the European Union Mm. What would you criticize it for? And, well, you know, it seems more the European Union of business and enterprise, and you know, what about workers? Mm. Um, and you know, I, I, I think Corbyn is stuck in that age, but mm. uh, that seemed. And then we have, and the school was like that. Then you know, the textbook was tossed out, and people started talking, mm. and that was uh, mm. great. But I sort of remember that as. Um, there was there was there was quite a lot of debate, debate, but also the textbooks, as we all know, mm. gave give a version, both mm. of the past and of the future, um, that needs mm. to be thought about. So you then go on to university. Mm. Where where did you go and what did you study? I studied sinology or Ch Chinese culture and languages. It was called really? in Dutch. Yeah. What made you choose that? Uh, nothing. <laughs> you chose it though. There's nothing comes of nothing, but I mean, I chose it for absolutely nothing to do with China. Mm. Um, and I've, I'm like everybody. I'm always asked the question of why did you do that, and I don't have a very good answer. Uh, I want to do something. I think secretly, most people. Well, I want to do. I, you know, in, in Holland, the system is that if you pass your secondary a certain type of secondary school, it gives mm. you access to any course you want, given that you've done the preparatory. Mm. Uh, so I couldn't have done medicine because I didn't do chemistry, but I could have done mathematics, theology, history, English. And I thought about English for a while because I was actually very good at it. Uh, and I liked reading English literature a lot, and I did all of that. Um, but in the end, I decided to choose between Arabic, Russian, and Chinese uh, for two reasons. Um, partly my father was urging me to do something that was more global than just European, and I, I saw the reason for that. He wanted me to do Arabic, hmm. and that was one good reason not to do that. <laughs> but I also thought about this, and I thought, well, the Middle East is a mess. Mm. And I can't see how that is going to change in my lifetime. And that seems, you know, they seem to be uh, continuing to prove that assumption. Russian seemed to me uh, rather dark for some reason. Mm. Not very articulate, no doubt, but, um, and all that Soviet stuff, I mean, you know. Ugh. Um, but China was still sort of a blank slate at the time. I this think. was about 1976. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. death of Mao. The death that, of Mao. Had that happened, or no? Because you have to choose earlier than that, oh, so the chronology mm. doesn't work out. But no, this was still a great old naivete about mm. China. 
So if that was one set of reasoning, I think the other set of reasoning, uh, as I'm sure you know, is that uh, to be a sinologist uh, is, is absolute evidence that you're very smart. And proving that was, I'm sure, very important to me. Mm. As I, mean, I think it is to very many mm. uh, sinologists in both the United States and here. So what was the main features of the course, the constituents? Is it mainly language? Is it mainly literature? Is it mainly... or is it just a mixture? It was, it was an introduction of the modern language, which was taught in a modern way. Uh, there was a bit of culture and history and so on. It was actually a very good course. Mm. Um, but it, I think, the, aside from the modern language, we were essentially prepared for the Chinese civil service examinations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we read the classics, the poetry, mm. and we still do this. Um, and maybe that's not such a bad thing okay. to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we still do it here. I mean, our students still mm. read much of the yeah. same stuff. The last place, probably on earth, where they'll still be doing the Chinese civil service examinations, yeah. Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of memorization. Um, mm. But again, it was a good group of students who became good friends. Mm. Um, and good teachers? Very good teachers. Very good teachers. Mm. It was Erik Zilcher, who was a great expert in Buddhism, mm. a rather distant figure. You know, but he had, you know, this was, I was bewildered, but that was not a bad thing. But, you know, they give you, in my second year, they said, well, why don't you read the Gautam Duan, which is whatever, sixth century selection of uh, articles in classical Chinese uh, about eminent monks. Uh, and you know, there's the library. Go work it out. And, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> how, how many characters did you have to learn to start no doing idea, something? But we were always. It was just constant, constant. But thousands. Thousands, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, both. And I, you know, it just was. I was. It fascinated me. Um, there was one other. Te- let me first tell you about another teacher. There is Wilt Idema, who is an amazing uh, person. A, nor- a great translator. Um, he ended up teaching at Harvard. He won the Erasmus Prize in Holland. Uh, but he has de- translated stuff both from Ch- into English and into Dutch. But has sort of brought all this stuff to to Europe and the United States. And he knows Chinese literature inside out. And he would just get us together and um, make us read that stuff. And then. He has that kind of feel for classical Chinese that it's like normal. Mm. And he sort of introduced us that way, through that world. Um, and he, you know, he had the kind of right attitude. Yeah, this is classical, but here you have this funny poetry, or this lovely anecdote, mm. uh, sort of painting, opening up that world. And this, this you know, this is a, a highly intelligent debate about some specific problem. Mm. But here's just a very funny story. Uh, and that that juxtaposition, I think, worked very well. And, mm. um, yeah. Did you do anything else, particularly as an undergraduate? Did you get involved in student politics or no? Uh, because drama or anything? no? Oh, a, there was no time. Mm. Uh, there were other things to do. But we had sort of uh, and student societies in Holland were. It. Um, they like to sit society in the United States. It was a kind of obnoxious groups, who mm-hmm. slight fascist tendencies, as far mm-hmm. as I could see. And so I was on the nihilists, mm-hmm. and uh, we refused to mm-hmm. participate in that kind of uh, nonsense. But we did have um, a group of friends <laughs> who were entirely obnoxious in believing that we would read on our own. Uh, and so put the world to right and produce and so you know my assignment was to heat, to read Heinrich Heine and somebody else did some mm. Japanese mm. stuff and so we got together and talked that way but it was all you know great fun of course. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened at the end of the course what did you then go on to do right so I'd done three years of that and at the end of the third year, some of us went, this was one of the first groups that went to China for a year of study. And I didn't. Um, and I needed a break. And so, and this was 
utterly critical in my life. So one of my modern language teachers, Chinese modern language teachers, came to the University of Pennsylvania and said, well, why don't you go to the University of Pennsylvania for a year? And there I met this absolutely superb woman uh, historian, uh, Susan Nakan. Um, and I didn't do any courses, wasn't working for a degree or anything like that, but she met me every Friday afternoon to discuss various monographs. Susan Nakan. Nakan. She is a, a Ming historian. How is it spelled, Nakan? And it's French, N A Q I. N-A-Q-U-I-N mm -hmm. um, and so we did and um, she sort of said no you, know, you decide what you want to read and then write a little report on it and we'll talk about it for an hour um, and at the end of the year I mean I, I fell in love with America I had a great time mm -hmm. and like that much broader approach to mm -hmm. thinking about history and literature and culture debate argument travel uh, I applied to various universities, and she sent me on to Harvard, and you know, then it rolled through. So, for me, doing Chinese is sort of you do one step, and then the next step comes and works out, and the next step works out, and then you know, you go to China, and you have a good time there, and archives open up. And, uh, you go to Harvard in about seventy-nine, eighty, eighty, yeah. and presumably John Fairbank is there. Yes, uh, he is there, but he no longer teaches. Mm -hmm. uh, my teacher was Philip Kuhn, mm -hmm. uh, who was an amazing mind, mm -hmm. uh, a very interesting figure. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and it, we were, you know, the American system, as you know, is very different. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of coursework, and uh, you're left on your own to read everything there is, and then. Mm -hmm. You're finally allowed to begin your PhD. Um, mm -hmm. So it's five years or so? Six uh, years. Seven years. Seven, years. Seven, years. seven, eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. You do a bit of teaching, mm. uh, spend a year in China. Um, who, who was your supervisor? Philip Kuhn. Mm. Yeah. And uh, you went to China in what year? It was 86. For the f well, I went to Taiwan in 83 for a year, mm. uh, which was a waste for, of for time. For a year? Yeah. A waste of time? Yeah. <laughs> Absolute waste of time. Why was that? Uh, because I don't still. T it was a waste of time in terms of writing a dissertation. Uh, because I was writing on the Chinese Communist Party uh, in Taiwan. This is still martial law. No archives are mm. open at all, mm. let alone about the Communist Party. Mm. Uh, so I just must have the most irresponsible step from my supervisor to let me do that. Um, but I met a lot of people um, mm. at the Academia Sinica uh, where I was working and I did read quite a bit. Mm. Um, it was unproductive, but um, yeah, it happens. It's all right. So you, you came back with not much and then you went out again. Yeah, and that, that was, this was in 86. Um, I had a good idea about what I wanted to do. The sources mm. were still a problem. But this was, you know, the 80s in China was very, you know, it was sometimes very tight, sometimes much more open, but it was an enormous energy, intellectual curiosity, liveliness. Mm. Uh, and I was at Beida, at Peking University, uh, and I was already looking at a lot of material that nobody else had seen in the United States or Europe. Uh, but I was talking with other graduate students mm. and made connections that way. Um, and at one point, a graduate student at People's University, Rinmin, mm. um, said, you need to have this collection of documents. Uh, and uh, it was inter classified, internal. Uh, and we spent, so he would give some stuff to me at the end of the day. Um, he would smuggle it out, I think. Uh, I would run down to... Um, at the offices of the Washington Post, <laughs> uh, because it couldn't be copied, right? So mm. they had a secret. They had a copy machine. So I was it, through the night. I was copying stuff, uh, and then it was two very big banks of documents. Uh, I left uh, and had all the materials I needed uh, for my dissertation. So, um, what what was the material about? It was about the first years of the Chinese Communist Party. Mm. So it included all the internal resolutions, all the reports, lots of letters, lots of memoirs, 
um, clearly not complete. I mean, mm. The archives are still not open, mm. uh, but a vast amount of stuff that nobody had seen uh, that allowed me to write about this, this process, the first seven years of the Communist Party in an entirely new way. Um, that was, you know, it wrote itself, it was easy. Is the, is the material still there? Yes, and I, yes, absolutely. So, th what I decided to do was to use two, uh, two big parts, two, and I could, there's no way I could use it all, but there was so much there. Mm. I gave it to the Fairbank Center, to Nancy Hurst, the librarian, she's still there. Uh, and I figured, you know, I've read this stuff, I've dealt with it, and I can write faster, mm. and, and so there's no problem in people catching up, and so it went there. And then fortunately, uh, most of my fellow graduate students and others who went to China, this was the time everybody was coming back with mm. them too, they all gave to the Fairbank Center. So they had a vast amount of they had to work the best collection on uh, Communist Party history, mm. which of course, you know, Rod McFarker is an example, mm. he's used to similar stuff. And mm. I was, you know, one of my lovely moments uh, was a very young graduate student um, you know, trying to write a dissertation was, was Stuart Schramm, who was the great scholar on, mm. on Maoism. Um, uh, he was sort of, we were going through some, he was clearly interested. And yes, yes, the, this, this great phrase, power comes out of the barrel of the gun, that's from 1935. <laughs> <said>, no! <laughs> 1927, and here is the evidence. And, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, so, but that, does, that material was sort of at that level of revealing this, the, the forced rethinking. Didn't it make it rather difficult to publish it? No. I mean, the Chinese government weren't concerned when your thesis was... It's never been translated. Oh. Uh, the only one that hasn't been. Um, no, I was not worried about, you know, clearly not being outside. Um, I've never been that afraid of of, you know, people very never, never have been there, but um, I know it's been read widely in China, it's been downloaded, mm. I know it from one website alone at least mm. 60,000 times. Mm. When I now meet some colleagues for the first time, oh yes, yes, from friend to comrade, yes. <laughs> uh, so it's circulated. But it uh, hasn't caused any, you any, you've never been blocked in going to China? No, I think this, the early history of the Communist Party simply is not sensitive enough. Mm. No. And what was your main conclusion from what you discovered? Ah, uh, um, that sort of very simply put, uh, well the title from friend to comrade I think mm -hmm. illustrates the point. This was a group of idealistic young men who um, traveled to France and Moscow and clearly superbly bright and from all over China. Um, uh, had sort of been chatting in various dormitories and tea shops and so on and got caught up in this revolutionary move, wave that swept through China in the 1920s and then realized in the end that A, they need a vast amount of discipline to make this work as a party, um, very tough, uh, and that they need a lot of violence if they're going to succeed um, to change China. Uh, that's one level. Uh, the other level is that these are just human beings, any political party, they are nasty to each other, uh, do terrible things to each other, uh, and at times can sound quite silly. Um, you know, there's one bit of this, one, fr one bit where I write about Mao, and you know, for a communist revolution we need a you know, party to, it wasn't, it wasn't that precisely, but you know, army, we need the masses, and three vegetable gardens. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> now we know where he got it from. <laughs> um, and who, who was your, who were your examiners? Uh, it was Ben Schwartz. Mm. Ben Schwartz and uh, Philip Kim's the supervisor. Mm. I don't know if anybody else had to read it. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, and Ben, uh, Benjamin Swartz, uh, was extremely, you know, wise person, very widely read, of course. Um, I think his 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 crushing comment was, 
um, uh, good for him. You know, this is a very nice dissertation. Yes, well, absolutely pass it. Now I want you to go to the beach and think for a while. <laughs> 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 Which is well, why I guess I'm in Cambridge. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, it did pass. And it did pass. Um, what happened then? I went to Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, which was great, um, and I talked to publisher and it was quite, quite quickly, two or three years, it was done, published. Uh, but halfway through, I did apply to come to, for lectureship. How yeah. long were you in Berkeley? In the end, just four or five months, oh, not long yeah. enough. Yeah, so that's no, mm. no. Mm. And in Chinese studies, it was empty at the time. Mm. Sort of the great people in the field were just not there. It was very. It was one of the. There were some Japanologists. So. Yeah, there were, but uh, not in Chinese. And, mm. um, so they didn't make any impact. But um, yeah, no. So February '88, I guess we moved here. Yeah. You hadn't married by then. I had married by then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You had been married. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, mention your wife. She's she somehow links you to some. Uh, pop artist or something I read in your Wikipedia. Your brother-in-law is... No, he's not a pop artist. Um, there are two, there are a couple of elements. We met at Harvard mm. where uh, Chinese studies were on the third floor mm. and Middle Eastern studies on the fifth floor mm. and there's an elevator in between. Mm. Uh, and so that goes on from there um, and, you know, quickly. Um, we, we decided to get married quite quickly um, for a number of reasons, because I was going to Taiwan and I didn't want to be unmarried in Taiwan and she wanted to come along and so on. Uh, and in Taiwan, we always said that we were married, we were 24, 25 at the time. Mm. And our neighbors, to their great credit, uh, refused to believe that forever. They did mm. not think that young Americans still got married. So this was, we were just being polite to them. Uh, mm. That was their conclusion. But you have to speak up a uh, bit on death. Uh, um, the, but the critical development in that year was mm. that my father-in-law, who was the president of the American University in Beirut, uh, was murdered by Hezbollah. Uh, and so right. that was an, actually not a reason why Taiwan academically was mm. simply not productive. Uh, it was a, a disastrous, a deeply, mm. um, yeah, uh, yeah, very difficult, very, very difficult. Um, so that's it. but so my wife was born in Beirut as, uh, as was her father so they have a deep uh, Middle Eastern connection mm -hmm. um, she went to she did study in, at AUC for a while not at AUC, at the American University in Cairo uh, so there's a deep, uh, long standing mm -hmm. uh, and a deep, very deep Middle Eastern connection that is clearly mm. part of our lives. Um, we meet many people uh, from that kind of, with that kind of background. Um, and that has been an interesting mm. sight, uh, but it confirms me in my belief that it's much better to study China than the Middle East. Um, not that it's less interesting, but it's, yeah. Um, <laughs> the other... A softer <laughs> voice than I do. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, so she was interested in that, and she did Arabic at mm. Oberlin mm. as part of her undergraduate liberal mm. arts degree. Loved music, did mm. a lot of, and Oberlin is famous for music. Uh, and then she did a PhD in uh, education uh, at Harvard. Mm. Uh, and I think for her to come here was a difficult thing. I was wondering, she came with you when you came oh, yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You came to a lectureship in Chinese? Yeah in the faculty or whatever it was then. Yeah. Um, was it already attached to a college or not? It was. I was this was rare at the time mm. uh, because people in my faculty were useless to colleges mm. given the number of students we had. But um, the then master of St. Catherine's was a good friend of Merle Goldman. Mm. Uh, who was, was a figure uh, in Chinese studies at mm. Harvard. Uh, and so when I was still at Berkeley, mm. uh, I received a call. Uh, and the first sentence I remember very clearly was, 
do you want a parking place in the middle of Cambridge? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or do you want to sell it all to someone else? <laughs> <laughs> so I said yes, and so the deal was done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was in 80 88. 88. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it was very privileged. I mean, many people don't get their uh, um, college attachments, and this was at St. Cat's. Yeah. Who, who was the master? Well, uh, just, 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 yes, I'm putting his name, which is terrible because he's. He wasn't. Man. He wasn't the. Um, I mean, the vice chair uh, later. No, no, it's not Swinnerton Dyer. No. Um, wasn't Barry Supple. Barry Supple. Barry Supple. Yeah. Barry. Yeah. 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 I know Barry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I knew him. Um, he was an economic historian as well. Mm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, was it a shock for you? Because of course you're not. I assumed you're coming from England to England, which you're actually uh, via America, but you're coming from Holland. It was a complete shock. Mm. In what way? Um, in many different ways, and I think this we were still recovering from bits of trauma mm. relating to my father-in-law's death. Um, it is such a different world. Um, I think part of the problem was that you arrive, we were in our late 20s. Most of my colleagues were much older. Mm. That's a weird thing. So sort of chatting around, going to the bars and things, the credit student life. Mm. Uh, no. Uh, but it's the wrong time in your sort of life cycle mm. when everybody is busy with careers or children and things like that. Mm. So it took us a while to get adjusted. The teaching system is very different. Um, the class is such an important part. Mm. Um, and the rituals around this place. Mm. Like, Did you like them or were you a bit shocked by them? I was appalled. Appalled? Yeah. <laughs> Utterly appalled. Um, yeah, I was. I thought it was stultifying. Mm. Uh, but it was because of like people like Chris Bailey mm. who understood that. Mm. There are a few people who understood that. Um, and they, that was a great help. Mm. And I think so that's say, right. say something about Chris. Um, at this well, I think Chris was just very gentle, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not that outspoken, mm -hmm. but I think very observant of people mm -hmm. and acutely aware. Um, and uh, acutely aware, maybe because of his own experiences in India, of how mm -hmm. different life can be. Mm. and in some ways how, uh, how odd English life can mm. be to outsiders. Um, he saw that and so he, he would regularly you know, have little chats and talk and encourage. And, mm. um, so, and he was also, I think that was one side of it. The other side of it is that then, and to a degree now, the, what was then Oriental Studies was heavily philological. Mm. And that I'm not uh, mm. and will never be. Um, and I think the same, less so, much less so, but to some degree, uh, was true, certainly, well, certainly true in Middle Eastern studies, Arabic, mm. um, and also in Indian studies um, for a mm. while, with Sanskrit being so, so dominant. So I think he saw that struggle quite clearly mm. um, and sort of encouraged me to follow my own way, mm. which was much more like his own way. Um, mm. How long really did it take you to get it incultured? Incultured? Have we ever? Does anybody <laughs> ever? Um, I think the real shift came when we had children hmm. um, and through the playground. In the, in the 90s? Yeah. 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 91, hmm. first lot. Um, yeah, and then life moved quickly on. And hmm. uh, that changed, you know, having children, first of all. Hmm changed our perspective on life and our enjoyment mm. uh, but it also we live in a small village and mm. I think in many ways a small village is, is actually a very open place once you've been there for a while mm. once you're part of the community where was that? Uh, in Meldreth Meldreth mm. first Foxton for a couple of years yeah. and then Meldreth yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it was very pleasant and I'm very glad we lived you're still there oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I can whenever whenever and somebody now asks me how long have you lived here, mm. I'm now so old I can say longer than you. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you come to appreciate the, the Cambridge teaching system, the supervision yes, system? Absolutely. 
and that very quickly actually mm. um, yes absolutely I liked a very individual personal mm. relationship mm. with students um, uh, yeah l unlike some of our colleagues I, 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 I really enjoy teaching uh, and more and more so I, that's mm. the one you know that's if, if you're asked what would you like to keep mm. uh, then teaching would be first I think and I have a room in some ways like this mm. and I sit around with my students and we talk and the students are bright and mm. uh, uh, they may not always be as prepared as you would like mm. they tend not to be but um, they are just very bright and very engaging and mm. um, no I think that that side of Cambridge I think is superb I, do, um, I think the, the different the three main kinds of teaching are we say undergraduate supervisions, then PhD supervising, yeah. um, and um, to a certain extent, well, and then lecturing. Do you like all those branches? I do, I do. In mean, lecturing, I do, with mm. performance, mm. Uh, but that's all right. Um, and small group teaching. Um, seminars. Mm. Seminars, I, I, yes, I do, I do very much like. Mm. And it's in some ways, I think one of the seminars I like best is my seminar on the Second World War in China, because mm. we have fourth year students, MPhil students, some PhD students. So British people, some of my PhD and MPhil students will be from China, mm. for whom this is a topic that cuts closely to the bone, of course, uh, and to get them all to engage, and some from America, some from the military. Uh, they're all very small groups, I mean, never mm. more than ten. Um, but that's that's an absolute delight to mm. uh, to see happening, and it's you know. And the other side of uh, life, which competes a bit with it, and I, you've done a lot of, is administration, because mm. unlike many universities, there's not a, a great deal done at the centre, and it's delegated down to departments and faculties, and you've been taken to that a lot I can see um, mm. is that something you bear with or you quite enjoy or you hate or what <laughs> uh, I, I, the only answer is all of them of course um, the faculty went through a very difficult period and I was chair at the time mm. you know, and people were commenting you, know, you walk into the building and you can feel the tension mm. cut through the tension and I d didn't like that it was a mm. terrible time um, so I don't like that. Uh, there's more and more bureaucracy that seems to me nonsense. Mm. Uh, form filling, uh, mm. surveys this, survey that, and, uh, driven by various legal provisions. And I think mm. nobody's guilty, but it's taking over life, and that's not mm. good. Uh, and that's so I don't want to do that. Uh, as an act of resistance, I uh, of the powerless. Uh, I refuse to fill out the uh, TAS, the Time Allocation Survey. <laughs> Did anything happen when you resisted it? Yes, it does, every year. Um, then there must be a computer bit that tells the heads of the department that they really must push me to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think they then email me. And I say, yes, no, I'm not going to do it. And then it tends to end. Uh, <laughs> You didn't have that in my time. I'm no, no, I, I, I think that has changed. Then. Mm. It's I've heard, I've heard. You know, REF is a good example. Mm. Which is exactly, ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, right, well, we've sort of got you to Cambridge and teaching mm. and so on. Um, tell me about your work on China. I mean, select one or two books or articles or themes that interest you and explain those, if you would. I think the two that I would say now, I mean, my interests fluctuate, of course they do. Mm. Um, and sort of an abiding interest, it is an abiding interest, is, is the whole theme of violence, war, organized, disorganized. Partly because it's um, a reality that uh, of Chinese history for the last two centuries, and hopefully now uh, it's expunged from the system for a while at least um, but I found that I found that interesting academically because people wrote about the communist revolution as if there had been no violence and I thought that was just the oddest way of thinking about it 
Uh, and of course China was written out of the Second World War uh, in both the United States and here. Yeah. Um, and both talking in China, um, yeah, talking in China with people, um, the violence is obviously there and has left all kinds of issues to be dealt with. So that has been an abiding, very much an abiding interest. Um, Do you think it relates to your own childhood? Of course it does, completely, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, and I find it very interesting that I can talk with my generation, mm. uh, not necessarily younger generation, in a way that I think people who have grown up in America or Britain probably couldn't, uh, because we went through, Holland went through all the troubles of mm. occupation, collaboration, starvation, uh, you know, this we can share stories and mm. that's I think um, yeah that's so that's that's that is clearly uh, uh, combined with that the the other side that I think that one has as you say sort of deep personal mm. right and it, it's a subject that I try to escape but I get pulled back into mm. All the time, I mean, I've tried to move out, but then there's something. Well, before you move to the other side, what are the books and articles that you've written about that aspect, and what is their main? Okay. Uh, so the first one was um, War and Nationalism in China, 24-25, 24, 25 uh, 24, sorry, 25-45. Hmm. That is um, th academically, it was an argument saying that the American judgment on China in the Second World War was completely wrong. Uh, and they had absolutely better wrong, and they had been completely uh, misguided uh, by the whole Stillwell narrative of Stillwell being a great hero and the Chinese incompetent and bloody and not willing to fight Japan. None of that is true. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I first started talking about it in the United States, people got very upset. Mm -hmm. So I was taking down one of their heroes, and they mm -hmm. did not like it. Uh, they were quite furious, and it took a while in America for that to be accepted. But It is now. It is now, yeah. And of course for the Chinese, I was using archives in China, mm -hmm. uh, in real serious archives. Mm -hmm. And I was the first to do that. Was, was an implication of what you said, that they backed the wrong side, backed Chiang Kai-shek? No. Um, well, yes, I mean, there's a bigger debate to be had. Mm. I mean, the Stillwell myth mm. of the nationalist being, you know, for having forgotten revolution or being incompetent or unpatriotic mm. had a lot to do with America's decision not to support uh, Chiang Kai-shek mm. during the Civil War, especially in 48, and that's Marshall, uh, General George Marshall. Um, and I thought there's a self-justification theme. Mm. And within the China field, especially in the United States, that is sensitive because if you challenge that, it means also saying that the judgment of the field that the nationalists were a lost cause is mm -hmm. wrong and politically implicated, at least. And because McCarthyism involved so, much, so many people in the China studies field, mm -hmm. I think that's why this became so mm -hmm. uh, stuck. Including Fairbank and... Uh, absolutely. And so to turn against that. Mm -hmm. Um, although I think one of the Chinese reviewers uh, had a wonderful line saying this is great and this is uh, you know serious history but bloody hell first it's Fairbank and then it's one of his students who get to say what's what <laughs> as it's no good <laughs> um, so that and then but I was the first to write military history. and coming to Cambridge was for me was a real but what it opened up to me was an ability to write about military history, because military history is a dead end in the United States, and it isn't, or wasn't here, and there were great military historians in the history faculty then. Uh, so that was very helpful, and I've been writing about various, uh, you know, a couple of uh, edited volumes, and then more recently, China at War, which uh, challenges, which tries to put the Civil War, the Revolution, mm. uh, plus the war against Japan and even Korea into one, uh, at least narrative, uh, mm. analytical framework. Uh, in part to sort of tell the Chinese that, you know, this, this is not just about Japan, you were killing each other too. 
Mm. Uh, don't forget that. Um, there were reasons for that, and the Hindus understand that that's one argument. Um, but the other side of that argument is also to sort of try to decenter um, the uh, Anglo-centered view, the second, the Churchillian view of the Second World War, to say that people fought the Second World War for many different reasons. And in China, that as as in India, as in Indonesia, uh, that was to get rid of the Europeans, uh, and you know that. That so the Churchillian view uh, mm. must come down. Um, it's sold much better in, in in China than it has here, so it hasn't con contributed to. For one reason I was writing is it was a Brexit argument. I mean that's mm. that's mm. clearly there. Uh, so I, I do still am moving towards a genuine trying to write a genuinely global history mm. that takes all these various disparate aspirations in all these different regions, mm. including. Uh, the Middle East into account. So I, one of the next books might be looking at historians reformulating the past and therefore also the future mm -hmm. during the Second World War in China, India, Indonesia, maybe Germany, mm -hmm. maybe the United States, maybe Japan, and look at it that way. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, I, but it's very, I've done some of it for China, and mm -hmm. it is, of course, very interesting. And it's not just about communism or nationalism. Mm. Many deeper questions there, as you know, about civilization and what it stands mm. for, uh, that emerge at that time. Mm. It might be a way of reviving interest in Toynbee, <laughs> uh, which would be interesting too. So that's the military side, uh, that will keep no doubt going. There's mm. so much to do, so much more to say. Did um, you say any, find anything that really particularly surprised or shocked you about the Japanese aspect of it? Apart from the ferocity, <laughs> there is a great deal of ferocity, but I think they are far more sophisticated in their approach mm -hmm. um, than we have assumed or been or allowed to admit. They were trying to create a China of uh, a whole range of regional and local governments, mm -hmm. and that actually had a lot going for it mm -hmm. and had quite a lot of support. The one thing that, that in doing this, in look, beginning to look at this in more broad way, I was quite shocked and interested and surprised to see that when the Japanese invaded uh, Indonesia, and this is from a Dutch history, the Dutch national history, they were welcomed. Absolutely. And I had always argued that the massacre in Nanjing, or the bombing, actually the bombing more than the massacre in Nanjing, the bombing, that sort of eradicated sympathy for the Japanese across Asia. That's not true. Mm. Uh, they were welcomed. Uh, well, they wouldn't have known about the bombing of Nanjing, would they? They did. They did? Of course, because the bombing was in thirty-seven. Yes. There was reporting on it in, in certainly in India. I don't know about it, but they, they, mm. they would have read it. Yeah. Certainly reported in Holland. Mm. Uh, so that, that was, was not a secret. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm sure. And, um, you know, they they did not like the Dutch, and so, for you know, that's for a range of reasons, the Japanese well, were welcome. Burma is another particular example. Yeah. <laughs> and even, uh, as I discovered, they were first welcomed in Nanjing. Hmm. Were they? Yeah. Because the nationalists had become such a mess. Mm. Anybody took this in. <laughs> So that, that, that uh, and uh, you know, you can, mm. even from the way I'm talking now, uh, you can mm. see that this is just in the bone, in the bones. Um, but the other side, and this is more by accident, uh, I've been very interested in, um, in, 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 in globalization, this of globalization, and I've been very fortunate uh, that I discovered the archives of the Chinese Maritime Customs Service. Uh, you discovered them? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in Nanjing. And this... Oh yes, that's uh, where they were, wasn't this, it? That's where they are, they still are. Yeah. Um, and I always talk with archivists. Hmm. Uh, I always have good luck in finding great sources in China. They, they find me, I don't know how, but they do. Did they hide them there? Or? No, no. Because uh, with many no. of the artifacts that the... Um, Chiang Kai-shek didn't take away, they'd, they'd been hidden, and so some of the Nanjing Museum stuff is 
was that? Yeah. No, they didn't hide them, but they had begun to collect them from across China in the 80s. I was working on my military history and mm. became friends with some of the archivists. And then they said, well, we have this building, um, which is half of all their holdings, just about, um, full with uh, the, the materials of the Maritime Customs Service. It is in English. <laughs> Might you want to help? And I, I first said, well, it's in English, so no. Um, because that's not what I'm interested in. I said, well, I will have a look, and then you see it's terribly interesting, and then mm. the projects emerge, and it needs to be catalogued and read into and digested. And so you're, I find are you running a project to catalogue it? It's stopped now, but we ran a project. To catalogue it? And We've done that, yeah. yeah. So you have to take all the, you know, people do this but you begin by taking every file off its shelf and mm. we restored the original it was a very simple archive but we restored the original customs indexes mm. uh, and, and catalogs so that we then could use their own search uh, mm. tools to mm. go through and that's been very very productive and, mm. very, and I think it's and, and one reason I wrote that book was a concern for globalization the, the, the book is Say the title. Uh, okay, so the, the, for the, 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 the breaking with the past, right? Uh, and I mean that in a, in a in a number of ways. But um, I was very interested in this whole hit process of mm. globalization. But I thought it was actually it is a, the, the customs. It's a very curious organization. Um, it's not British, as many people believe, at all. Um, it was subject to the Chinese state, first mm -hmm. the Qing, then the Republic, yeah. various Republican governments, and, and they dismissed people, so they were, they were not completely powerless. But at the upper levels, it was run largely by foreigners, but from all over the world. So you have some interesting British people, mm. but also Belgians, Italians, Russians, Americans, Dutch, mm. Japanese. And when Japan invaded China in 1937, the head of the customs service was Japanese. <laughs> and he used that to dampen down the effect that mm. could have. So you get all kinds of mm. stories that don't fit the narratives mm. that we're used to. And I think Robert Hart is a very good example of that. Mm. Robert Hart was absolutely despairing about what the British were doing in China. Mm. I'd seen the occupation of Canton, mm. for instance. He was a very religious man and he wanted to do good in China. Mm. And he believed that carving out a, tra a place to trade mm. uh, on the basis of a commonly accepted set of rules would be the best way to do that. Mm. And it took off from there. Um, and of course, Robert Hart is from Ireland. Mm. And I think that positioning is something that Chinese need to be told before they understand the implications. But he, you know, for him, the potato famine was current mm. memory, right? Mm. And he knew the, you know, he wanted to be part of the British elite. Mm. But like many people from that kind of background, mm. they, 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 they streamed through uh, various institutions of empire to do that, but with their own Irish background very much in mind. Mm. And as I, I think sort of one way to drive that home is that, as I'm sure you've seen, uh, the post boxes in China, the post office colors in China mm. are green, not red. And that's because of heart. <laughs> he chose it. <laughs> he chose it. What a nice thing, I've never noticed that. And it's the same, exactly the same, in both Taiwan and the mainland, but not in Hong Kong. <laughs> I think that says a lot. Yes, certainly it does. I mean, what an intriguing footnote. What is your, you talked about him a bit, but what is your kind of estimation and feeling about Robert Hart? Because I know him very I think he's a model in, of sense. Uh, he learned Chinese deeply. Uh, he learned, he, he went to Ningbo first. Mm -hmm. and as he, he was very good at languages. As a young man, you know, the Chinese chicha. Mm -hmm prepared him for the civil service exam. So mm. he, had, he had an ability to, therefore, to talk with, to engage with Chinese elites in, mm. in, in a virtually common 
basis, a basis of equality. Um, so there was that, and he had a real respect for Chinese learning, the Chinese ways of living, mm. uh, Chinese food, Chinese dress. Uh, of course, he had Chinese children, uh, we know that now. Um, but he also was sort of a master at running a difficult bureaucracy over a very large empire, using both what we would understand as sort of Weberian rational bureaucratic means, mm. but also traditional Chinese ways where he thought them preferable and superior. And, uh, you know, he helped, I think, put the country together after the Taiping Rebellion. He shepherded it through the disasters of the Boxer Rebellion, because he died just before the 1911 revolution. Uh, but he gave China a, a, an institution that was a model institution at a very important moment when very little else seemed to be working, but which also simply delivered the goods um, in terms of money for the state, which needed it badly. Uh, in the alternative, it's been horrendous. Um, and his phrase was always, you know, like, as long as we are helpful, we will be okay. And as long as we keep in mind that, our, that those we serve are, first of all, those who pay our salaries, or the Chinese. Um, so I really think he set a model for engaging in China, with China, uh, that remains valid for today. Is he still, is he known and respected there now? He is hugely. He is the most famous foreigner in China. Really? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, he is in, yes, the Khuda. Mm. When you go to China and you see, uh, when you go through customs, mm. you see the customs. That's it. And certainly all historians know about this and he's in textbooks and this is, mm. you know, even in, in, in history textbooks in secondary schools, I think he's there. Mm. You know, he's the most famous British person, period. Mm. Oh, nice. It's not Churchill, it's hard. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I've got um, a couple more questions. Um, I suppose one is um, your estimation, it's a difficult, tricky question really, but your estimation of how things are going in China now. Ah, okay. Um, my China now, mm. uh, you, uh, you inevitably also talk about how we approach China now. Mm. Uh, and there's a t change, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of. Mm. I think China now is facing a great many... You know, on the one hand, they have enormous reasons to be enormously proud of what has been achieved mm. in three or four decades. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy being in China tremendously. I have mm. good friends and you know, feel very comfortable. Mm. Uh, I happily live there. Um, but, of course, what the government is doing in terms of shutting down uh, debate, discussion, etc., that's for intellectuals certainly a disaster. Mm. Although I'm sure that if there's an election, Xi Jinping would win hands mm. down. It's just, mm. That's how it is. I think there are elements of, of development that um, are, you know, the pollution is. Are you happy with that to be shown on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He's yeah, not looking for my uh, <laughs> approval. Um, I think. The countryside, I worry about in a great deal, mm. uh, and it seems China is is so busy with all its high rises in cities like mm. Shenzhen and mm. Shanghai uh, to forget its past. I mean, some people have uh, there's a new longing for the countryside, but mm. it, it's in the nature of we'll drive our car into the countryside and have a cup of and tea, a lovely and meal, <laughs> a lovely meal, and then go back. And that, that's not what I mean. Mm. Um, the countryside is not a good place to be. Uh, the suicide rates are very high in China mm. in any case. Mm. Um, and you understand why I'm concerned about those kinds mm. of issues. But they are terrible in the countryside. And mm. I, this, is, this needs to be fixed. This is farmers. Who are yeah, so the farming is done by women and children. Mm. The men are in the cities. Um, mm. And it's, it's, you know, that's... And of course the whole nature has been destroyed. So I, I think the fate of the farmer across the world has mm. not been a good one, mm. but they were used by the Chinese Communist Party to seize power in '49, mm. and almost as soon as they could after that, they left the 
countryside. I think that's just, and, and, and left the farmers to their own fate, mm. made them second class citizens through the Hukou system. Mm. And now the rich on the, on the coast mm. are becoming rich because these farmers are now in the countryside as mm. a cheap labor. Uh, this is not good mm. and, and actually should be a real point of shame. I think Xi Jinping is trying to do something about it. I think mm. that's true. Mm. But it clearly isn't going far enough. Mm. So that's a big you yeah, know, for me. Yeah. Mm. And you've partly answered it, but mm. that's China now. Um, China in the future, next 10 years, do you, you said earlier that you didn't think it would go back to its violent mm. past. Um, that's internally and presume hopefully not externally, yeah. but uh, do you have any other thoughts about the direction in which it's going over the next 10 years? Uh, let me put it this way. I think Xi Jinping is trying to do something that is very difficult and has never been done successfully before, which is to turn one country into a superpower. Mm. Uh, the Dutch didn't do it very well. <laughs> the British didn't do it very well. The Russians were terrible at it. The Americans were also terrible at it. So there's going to be a problem, mm. inevitable, absolutely inevitable. Uh, but I think, you know, at least there's that history, and I think Xi Jinping, well, we know that the elites, at least in Beijing, are aware of that history. Um, they, and they, so they talk about Japan and Germany in mm. as sort of negative examples. Of mm. We don't want to go there. But it is a difficult task. Mm. Um, I, am, I am an optimist. Mm. Uh, I think there's sort of a number of short-term and then longer-term problems, the financial trouble, is, mm. uh, the credit issues, debit issues, mm. the debt is terrible, the sort of pensions, mm. the, the basic problems of a huge population that is very uneven, both in its gender division and its uh, young and old division. Mm. Uh, these are problems of governance that are tremendously difficult. Um, and there's also the issue of security. Uh, China doesn't feel secure. Mm. Which is, and it, it needs a navy, it needs a powerful navy. Mm. That navy needs to go somewhere. Mm. And we do know that the First and Second World Wars began or were partly created by failures of sitting at powers mm. to deal with the naval aspirations of an mm. up and coming power. Mm. Um, so I think that's, these are all difficult questions. Good. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you would have liked me to have? No, it's been a pleasure, really. Yeah. <laughs> good. Well, it's been Always a good. Pl pleasure for me too. <laughs>